Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. Think of what you know today about viruses that you had no idea about 15 months ago. mRNA, spike proteins, monoclonal antibodies, all a part of a newly learned vocabulary of COVID. We understand the virus and what it can do, as 3 million people have died from it. But we also understand the wonder of vaccines and how it can be stopped in its tracks. What we don't know is where it came from. The debate over the question of where it came from, the natural world, or escaped from a lab in Wuhan is not an abstract question. Not for the virus, not for the future of pandemics, which will happen, and not for the geopolitical relationships between China and the rest of the world. Joe Biden has asked the intelligence community to get to the bottom of this, and maybe they will. In a way, it's another example, though, of how politicized the question has become. But to get to the so-called bottom of it, really requires science. The virus has left many clues, biomarkers, biological footprints that are difficult and complex to understand. But when closely examined, the conclusions become a lot clearer. While there has been more and more reporting on the possibility of the virus having escaped from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, so far the pantheon of such reporting has been the work of my guest, Nicholas Wade. Nicholas Wade is a science writer, editor, and author who's worked on the staff of Nature, Science, and for many years, the New York Times. His recent story in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and on Medium is the gold standard right now to begin to understand the truth about where COVID SARS-2 came from. And it is my pleasure to welcome Nicholas Wade here to the program. Nicholas, thanks so much for joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's a delight to have you here. First of all, talk a little bit about the fundamental options that that lie before us in terms of where this virus could have come from, the natural world or from the lab in Wuhan? Well, the two principal ones um, are natural emergence and lab escape. So natural emergence is very plausible because the SARS-1 epidemic of 2002 and the MERS epidemic of 2012 both originated uh, from coronaviruses uh, from from bats and uh, particularly SARS-1 that was uh, found in civets, these are animals eaten in Chinese wet markets. Uh, these seem to provide a, a forecast of what might have happened with SARS-2. So it was very natural from the start to think, to consider that it might have originated uh, from bats via some intermediary animal host. So that was one hypothesis that was on the table. And the second, of course, was that it escaped from a lab. The pandemic first broke out in the Chinese city of Wuhan, and there in the, toward the center of Wuhan is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which is a main research uh, center on coronaviruses in China. So lab escapes do occur from time to time. They're, they're not infrequent. So it was certainly uh, possible that the virus had come from some experiment in the in the Wuhan lab. Those are the, t- the two principal scenarios. Now, a third one is that the virus had jumped directly from a bat to human. So that's a little h- harder to get a grip on. And I haven't discussed that so much, but I can uh, uh, try and do so f- at some point if you would like. We'll come back to that as, as we move along. One of the things that, that you talk about is that with, with SARS-1 and with the MERS virus, There was some very concrete evidence with respect to how those viruses evolved naturally. Talk about that. Uh, The the concrete evidence was, uh, uh, firstly, that we've uh, uh, located the the bat population from which uh, the the SARS-1 virus probably came. That's the first bit of evidence. The second is that we've found the the intermediary host animal, the the civets that I mentioned, that are eaten in Chinese wet markets and that were infected with this virus. But most convincing of all, I think, is that you can see the virus gradually gathering strength as it acquired new mutations by which it adapted to human cells and, and to becoming a serious human pathogen. You see a handful of mutations that sort of made it able to infect civets and then a handful more mutations and it is a sort of mild pathogen in humans, uh, a few more and it's a strong pathogen and after I think about 30 mutations, it really takes off as as a very serious human disease. Uh, So that is 
what you would expect to find for SARS-2, but very strangely, none of that his uh, record is, is there. SARS-2, right from the beginning, is very well adapted to attacking human cells. And that is a serious puzzle for the natural emergence theory to explain. Expand on that a little bit in, in the way in which mutations play a key role in adapting the virus to be more aggressive as far as humans are concerned. Well, what the virus has to do is to uh, change its um, spike protein. That is the, the, the part of it that latches on to it, its target. And the spike protein is exquisitely ad- adapted to recognize the, the target of, of whatever the current host is. So the bat target, although it's the same molecule as in humans and other animals, uh, over the course of evolution, it's become somewhat different. So the virus, if it's going to switch from one host to another, it has to change the the recognition site on its spike protein so that it matches the the new host well enough for the virus to grab onto the cell it's going to infect. And it makes that change by in evolution's way by sort of gathering mutations, by, by waiting for a lucky a change in its uh, nucleotides that will change one of the amino acids in its spike protein and thus enable it better to recognize its new target. And give us a sense of how long it took with respect to SARS-1 and, and other viruses to really identify the host, to really identify how that virus had progressed. How long a period of time did it take scientists to figure that out? Well, it was a matter of months. As I recall, it was like three or four months for SARS-1 and seven months for, for MERS. So, so pretty quickly, we'd found the traces in the natural environment of, of those viruses making their, their jump to humans. And yet we're, we're now, what, 15, 16 months after the outbreak of, of COVID-19, and we still haven't found a single trace of evidence in the natural environment. How unusual is that? Well, it does seem pretty unusual, at least for coronaviruses. Now, now there are other cases with which I'm not so familiar. I know it took a long time to find the host population of Ebola, of the Ebola virus. Uh, But certainly for a coronavirus, and given the very intensive search you assume that the Chinese authorities made, it certainly is uh, unusual to say the least that they haven't found a shred of its passage in the natural environment. And of course, each month that passes with no such evidence, I think the natural emergence theory uh, looks weaker and weaker. And talk a little bit about the Wuhan lab, about the Wuhan Institute of Virology and what we know about it and its history. Uh, Well, it is the leading uh, institute in China for the study of coronaviruses. Uh, It has a, a an internationally known researcher there, Dr. Zhengli uh, Shi, uh, who is an expert on sort of finding and collecting these viruses and, and exploring their molecular biology. She's known as, as Bat Lady in, in China uh, because of her intense interest uh, in, in this uh, field. She has been responsible, so far as we know, for all or most of the research into these bat coronaviruses. One of the things you write about is that initially there was tremendous pushback, and you talk about some letters that were written in an article that was published in The Lancet, the pushback to the very notion that this could have been something created in the lab. Talk about that. Well, there was pushback, but it all, all rested on these two letters from two group, two small groups of virologists, uh, and yet they were tremendously effective. So the first letter was in The Lancet, um, uh, which uh, derided lab escape as a conspiracy um, theory. Um, it later turned out that letter had been drafted and organized by uh, Dr. Peter Dashak, the president of the EcoHealth Alliance in New York, through whom the NIH channeled its research grant to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So if indeed the virus had escaped from the Wuhan lab, Dr. Dashak, would be potentially at fault. So he certainly had a conflict of interest, which you would think should have been declared to the readers of the Lancet. It was not. And in fact, the Lancet letter ends, we declare no conflicting interest. So that was a problem with the first letter. And the problem with the second letter, which came from 
a group of uh, I think five or six, five um, virologists headed by uh, Dr. Christian Anderson. The problem with that letter was that they began by assuring readers that the virus could not have been manipulated, but they were assuring readers of a fact they could not know was true because viruses can be manipulated in many ways that leave no traces. It's true there is one way of manipulating viruses that does leave a trace, but there are other ways, uh, notably cell passage, uh, by transferring the virus repeatedly from uh, from one group of cells to another, or secondly, by uh, genetic manipulation uh, using uh, invisible traces. It's called the no technique. So these two techniques would have let the virus be manipulated, and Dr. Anderson and his fellow virologists had no way of knowing whether or not this was the case. Yet nonetheless, they assured everyone that the virus couldn't have been manipulated. So these two letters, very inadequate as they were, were not challenged by science journalists, by the, the media in general, and they set the tone for the uh, mindset that lasted for well over a year. Scientists, as you, as you point out in, in your article, scientists tend to be a curious lot. They tend to push back a lot to things that they read, things that they hear. Why do you think there was not more pushback to these two letters? Well, I think as far as the virologists were concerned, they had definitely a lot to lose if indeed the virus does turn out to escape from a lab because it would reflect badly on the general safety standards in virology labs and more particularly on the whole idea of doing what's called gain-of-function experiments. That's when you take a virus and you enhance its ability to uh, cause in infection. Um, so they, uh, the virologists as a whole were very content just to let these... Uh, the Daszak and Anderson letters uh, sort of lie out there in the literature, and as long as no one was questioning them, the, virus, the virologists weren't going to question them either. You talk about NIH having money invested, essentially, in, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Talk about that. Uh, well, this is a complicated question, which I don't think we fully understand as, as yet. The, the NIH uh, uh, funding to Dr. Daszak, which he in turn, in turn subcontracted, um, to Dr. Xi. Uh, we don't know exactly what the grant proposal was. All we have is a, an abstract, which is in the public record. So that abstract seems rather clearly to describe gain-of-function experiments um, because it, it says that you, by genetic manipulation, they were going to test various uh, spike proteins, see how well they worked in infecting human cells and humanized mice. <clears throat> it certainly looks like a gain-of-function experiment, and this, of course, raised the question that funding such experiments was prohibited by a moratorium in the U.S. that lasted from 2014 to 2017. So why was the NIH apparently evading the terms of this moratorium? That's, what you, that's the question you ask yourself when you first look at, at this grant abstract. But there was a surprising turn of events a few days ago when Dr. Fauci, he's the director of the NIAID, assured a Senate hearing that the NIH had never funded any gain-of-function research. So Dr. Fauci is a, is a respected uh, public servant of long standing. I see no uh, reason to doubt his word. So the question then becomes, how do you reconcile what he said with the apparent language of the grants? Um, so I think the first question you come to is, well, how is it possible to to put a, the spike protein of one virus into the backbone of another, thus creating a novel virus, and be sure you aren't somehow enhancing the property of the virus, or, or be sure you aren't creating a new virus which will have greater properties than, than either of the parent viruses, and that will be gain of function. Well, the, the, way, the way you could do that is to is to take as your sort of recipient virus, as the sort of backbone genome you're going to insert the other spike protein gene into, if you make sure that that genome is somehow attenuated, you've sort of crippled the virus's capability in some way so that it cannot sort of function as a, as a, as a real infective virus. <clears throat> and you put your test spike protein gene into it, you can argue there's no way in which that 
um, combined virus, that chimeric virus. They're called chimeras if they're a mixture of two genomes. There's no way the chimera could be more infective than the virus from which you've taken the spike protein because the spike protein has now been sort of degraded, as it were, by being put into an attenuated genome. So that could be the kind of experiment that the NIH had assumed was being going, would be undertaken by, by Dr. Xi, um, and that it would be the basis on which Dr. Fauci assured the Senate that NIH had never supported a gain-of-function research uh, uh, through this grant. Is it possible that, that he didn't know that this work was being carried out, that this grant was being issued by NIH without him knowing the details? Uh, no, that's, that's not possible because once he had this grant, uh, I've been told by, by um, his agency, the NIAID, he then got a, a second a panel of scientists to, to peer review it and make sure that it was not gain of function. So he definitely knew about the grant and was aware of the gain-of-function issue, and he took what seems seems like reasonable steps to assure himself that this grant would not be used for gain-of-function. So one sort of left with the, left with, the, with the sort of puzzle of this abstract. You would think if the grant had been so so carefully tailored, so carefully designed that there would be no gain-of-function, you you would think that would be reflected in the abstract, but the abstract says nothing about and we will use attenuated genomes in, uh, only to test out these spike proteins. It, that, that caveat, that cautious statement simply is not there. And if you look at other, other sources, particularly statements made by uh, Dr. Dashak, uh, very shortly before the pandemic uh, was known about, uh, he was t uh, talking happily about transferring spike proteins from one virus to another um, in a very enthusiastic way, which sort of seemed to seemed to make, make evident that gain of function was what was uh, going on by Dr. Xi, who was using um, his grant. And talk about Dashak and what we know about him and his previous work that might help us better understand this. Well, his background, I think he's a, a parasitologist, um, but in any case, he, sort of, he built up the EcoHealth Alliance as a, uh, as a place for I investigating animal viruses that that had the potential to jump to humans. So he receives a lot of grants from the NIH and other agencies of government to pursue these investigations. And he has studies going all over the world into dangerous, into da dangerous animal viruses. What do we know in terms of the safety and the safety precautions at the Wuhan lab? Well, uh, uh, safety levels are divided into four levels of increasing severity, known as BSL-1 through BSL-4. So the really serious level is BSL-4. That's where you handle pathogens like Ebola and Marburg uh, viruses. And, and those are the ones people are probably familiar with. There are many pictures of Dr. Xi on the internet showing her in, in one of these bubble suits, all sort of gloved up with sort of airflow going the right way. But below that, there's a sort of big jump when you come down to the lower three levels uh, called BSL-1, 2, and 3. Uh, and Dr. Xi has written that all, that all her experiments with coronavirus um, took place at, at levels BSL-2 and BSL-3. So, so BSL-2 is, is not really very much. It, it just requires you to wear a, a coat and gloves and to work under a hood, plaster and notice on the door saying biohazard. It's being compared to the, the safety level of a dentist's office. It may be sort of effective in general, but it's not very high. And this was the level that they were operating under for whatever experiments they were doing with the coronavirus. Uh, yes, Dr. Xi has written that her experiments were done in BSL-2 and BSL-3, and her papers also uh, record that she was uh, uh, using BSL-2 for many, if not most, of her experiments. Now, I should say at once that in doing so, she was following international rules for handling coronavirus. So these rules say that, that if you're working with um, SARS-1 or MERS, the viruses that caused the two previous epidemics, you must use BSL-3. But for all other coronaviruses, you can work in BSL-2. So this seems to me somewhat illogical in that if you create a novel coronavirus in BSL-2, then 
it could well be more infectious than you uh, expect and could be as dangerous, or if not more dangerous, than SARS-1 and MERS. So you would be finding yourself having generators of virus in totally inappropriate safety conditions. And this is what may have happened in the Wuhan lab. And it is not unusual, it's rare perhaps, but not unusual for a virus to escape from a lab. Uh, yes, exactly. There is a long record of viral escapes from labs, even highly dangerous viruses like smallpox, which everyone knows to be immensely careful of. Um, have, uh, smallpox escaped twice from a, a lab in Britain. There's been about sort of one uh, one escape a year ever since, and that's just escapes we know about. I mean, there's reason to believe that l- lots of these escapes are not reported. The, the case of SARS-1 is particularly uh, uh, interesting, and this virus has already escaped six times, four of them from the Beijing Institute of Virology. Talk a little bit about why you th- would argue that there was reason for both the virologists at the Wuhan Institute, the scientists there, and for the Chinese government to want to really keep this under wraps if, in fact, it was a virus that escaped. Well, I suppose you could say in retrospect that the best thing to have done if it if it were an escape virus was to come clean immediately and tell the world what had happened, do your best to clear it up. And, and one probably could have gained the world's sympathy because, after all, Dr. Xi, as I said, was working under international rules. Virologists everywhere were doing the same as she was. We know, as you, as you just uh, brought out, that, that lab escapes happen anywhere. She, uh, the Chinese could have argued, well, it was bad luck it happened on, on their territory, that this research was funded, after all, by the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. They were terribly sorry. They're going to do their best to clear it up, make sure nothing like this ever happened again. I mean, in retrospect, that would have been a, a very good course of action, assuming we are indeed talking about lab leak. Um, you know, who knows why they chose the other course? I, I guess, you know, they are an authoritarian government. It's the knee-jerk reflex of authoritarian governments to cover things up. We know the Chinese, in fact, tried to cover up the SARS-1 epidemic, uh, even though that was clearly of natural uh, origin. So I suppose once, you know, once they started down this uh, path, they uh, they pulled out all the stops, and you can see signs of a very sort of uh, thorough campaign to to wall off all information about what might have happened in in the lab we we know nothing about the viruses dr she was working on what her experiments what experiments she was doing uh one very curious fact is that all the uh, chinese databases to do with coronavirus were closed down and dr she has said that they, well they were closed down because there were so many hacking attempts but the thing is they were closed you could you could believe that if, if they'd been closed down in, in sort of December, January 2020, say. They were closed down in September of 2019. So why would the Chinese close down coronavirus databases at that date? It's very hard to explain unless, unless they knew about the epidemic much earlier than they've said. And wouldn't that be consistent with the stories that have been reported out more recently about the the individuals there that got sick and had to be hospitalized back in 2019? Uh, Yes, Jeff, I think that's just right. I I think when the full story comes out, we will see that the epidemic began considerably earlier than the Chinese have said. So these recent stories, in fact, they did come out several months ago, but have been sort of reinterred. they came, come from the State Department, and presumably they're from intelligence sources, uh, and they asked the effect that three uh, lab workers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in the autumn of 2019 became seriously ill with, uh, with uh, some very severe respiratory disease. So you can't entirely rule out influenza, but the, the, the symptoms uh, seem compatible with uh, COVID-19, and that, that is what they may have had. Uh, and if so, that, of course, provides an explanation of how the virus got out of the lab. It infected the lab workers first, and they took it to their family, and soon it was spreading all over Wuhan. And it also would correspond to when the database was shut down. Yes, exactly. It's complicated, I know, and in your story, it's even difficult to grasp it for those of us that are not scientists. But talk a little bit 
about the virus itself and what it exhibited in ways that might lead one to believe it was something created in the lab, it was something created through this gain-of-function method? Well, the virus has a, a very unusual uh, feature for viruses of its family, and that is something called a furin cleavage site. Uh, so when the virus attacks a human cell, um, its spike protein, which consists of two parts, one part has to latch on to the target on the surface of the human cell, and the other part, these things are called S1 and S2, the other part, S2, then has to help the virus's membrane fuse with the membrane of the human cell so that the virus can inject its nuclear material into the cell and command it to make more viruses. But before S2 can deploy and do its job, it has to be cut away from S1. So right at the junction between S1 and S2 in the virus's genome, you see instructions for uh, making a, a short string of amino acids, those are the units of proteins, uh, called the furin cleavage site. Now, human cells are studied with um, an enzyme called furin, um, so its job is not to cut viruses, uh, but it happens to be there for the virus's purpose. So as soon as the furin sees this particular sequence of amino acids called the furin cleavage site, it will cut it. Um, so that enables the virus to get to work um, immediately, and it makes it much more infectious um, for human cells. So if you look at the, uh, the other viruses in the family of, of uh, SARS-CoV-2, um, this little family is called Sarbeco viruses. None of them has a furin cleavage site. They all get into bat cells by, by some other method that does not involve furin cleavage. Now, this is a big problem for those who think the virus arose by natural emergence because although viruses are often sort of swapping bits of genetic information, which happens when, when two related viruses happen to invade the same cell and they mix up their genetic components as they're creating progeny viruses, although they often pick up new bits of information, genetic information that way, they can only pick up genetic information that already exists in their viral family. Um, so since Sarbeco viruses, only, none of them apart from SARS-CoV-2 have the furin cleavage site, you have to ask, well, where the hell did it get it? Now, it could get it by mutation, but mutation usually happens randomly, always happens randomly across the genome, and it would be very unusual for mutation to sort of create uh, four amino acids, four new amino acids altogether in, in a line. So you can pretty much rule out mutation, leaving, leaving with a big problem to explain if you believe in natural emergence. So the, the explanation that natural emergence th theorists give is that, well, sure, there, there's no, there are no fear in cleavage sites in Sarbeca viruses, but when it jumped to humans, it picked up the furin cleavage site there. Because that's what humans have. But if that were true, you would expect to, to, to see some population in China where the virus had, had jumped to first without its furin cleavage site and gradually sort of improved its ability to attack human cells by uh, you know, acquiring various other mutations and, occlude, and, and eventually including the furin cleavage site. But you can't find such a population which you would expect to do because hospitals have sort of you know, surveillance systems where, where they sort of monitor the levels of disease in a population. And that's how we've found all these mutations with SARS-1, at least in part. There's no evidence of such a population there showing how SARS-2 got a fear in cleavage from humans. So it, it, it's a problem for natural emergence. On the other side, on the other scenario, lab, lab escape, um, well, it's easy. Virologists have known for years that the way to really enhance a virus, make it very capable of attacking human cells, is to insert a furin cleavage site uh, at the S1, S2 junction. Dr. Shi herself has done this uh, uh, along with several other scientists. So that would explain very easily how SARS-2 has this somewhat unusual feature. Can we take away from this the idea that perhaps because of the moratorium on doing this kind of gain-of-function work here in the U.S., that this was a way to kind of offshore that work? I've heard that suggestion, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's plausible. I, I think all that was happening here was that 
was that Dr. Fauci recognized that these coronaviruses posed a serious uh, threat to human health. After all, they'd, they'd already generated these two earlier uh, epidemics. Um, so he was reaching out to, to the best Chinese expert on coronaviruses, Dr. Xi, and enlisting her help in studying them. Um, so I think he was he wasn't trying to offshore the research. He was just going to the best source for it. But it does appear, if if one believes that it, that this was as a result of, of a virus escaping from the lab in Wuhan, that there was gain-of-function work being done. Yes, it certainly looks like it. I mean, we know from Dr. Xi's uh, previous research that she was an expert at, at, at inserting these spike protein genes into other coronaviruses. Uh, there's one of her papers that, in fact, mentions support from this grant, although it so happens that the, the novel chimeric viruses she created then did not have gain of function, but it was exactly the kind of experiment in which you would, you would uh, accomplish gain of function. Um, we know from Dr. Dashak's um, descriptions in an interview he gave in uh, December 2019, just before we knew of the pandemic, um, how, you know, how vigorously she was she was transferring um, spike proteins. Um, so it definitely makes it, it sound like that's what she was um, doing. And if she was using NIH funds for it, then according to Dr. Fauci, she would have been uh, violating, I mean, he hasn't said this, but in, inferentially, she would have been v violating the conditions of the NIH grant. And where does Dr. Collins come into this, essentially Fauci's boss and, and the head of uh, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease? Uh, well, he has is, he is joined Dr. F uh, Fauci in putting out statements saying the NIH uh, never supported gain-of-function uh, research through this grant. If we had known from the very beginning what the potential real cause of this, that it had to do with, with a leak from the lab, that, that this gain-of-function work had been done, and that it was consistent with the things that you've been talking about, would that have made any difference? Would that have arguably helped in fighting the disease early on? I, I don't know. It's just very hard to say. Other than in, a, in a general sense, the, the sooner we'd uh, known about it, uh, the better off we would uh, have been, uh, you know, I think your question really goes to you know, would the would the vaccine makers have produced a different vaccine if they'd uh, known about the the origin of of SARS-CoV-2? And my guess is the answer is they wouldn't. They were they were just dealing practically with the virus at hand, and it didn't probably wouldn't have made much difference to them where the virus came from. I guess it goes to two issues: one, the vaccine ultimately. But but even in terms of the treatment of it, knowing about the ferrin cleavage, knowing about more about the virus itself, would that have helped in in any kind of treatment of it? Well, uh, yes, it might have done. You know, I'm probably speaking beyond my um, exact knowledge, but I you know I think the ferrin cleavage site because ferrin is so common in human cells that ferrin cleavage site sort of expands the range of the virus so it's not restricted to airway cells uh, as other respiratory viruses are it can also attack brain and and other organs so i guess if we'd if we'd known the ferrin cleavage site had been inserted well but i mean we we knew that i'm backtracking on, on sure the sure it's okay thought. um you know, it was recognized from the start, although very curiously, Dr. Xi did not mention the presence of the fear in cleavage site in her first paper about the virus, which you would think uh, stood out a mile to any competent virologist. We, we did know very shortly after the after this, the sequence was published that there was a fear in cleavage site there and any virologist could see it. So I, I, didn't, I didn't see that it would have made much difference to the various treatments uh, and especially the vaccines that, that were produced. What is your sense of what this tells us for the future of work being done with viruses around the world? Well, in one way, it tells us how, how dangerous they are and how, how comparatively it e easy it is to, to make them even more so. So I am biologists have long been you know, warning that, that genetics provides the route to the, the poor man's nuclear weapon. And we've certainly seen how destructive this virus is. So I, I think it uh, is going to make people focus on how better to prevent the spread of tools that might allow freelancers to, to manipulate viruses. Um, that's on the sort of terrorist side of, 
events, uh, on the public health side of events, um, I guess we already knew that, that we're, we're seeing an increasing number of these viruses emerging from animal hosts to humans as we destroy or invade the habitats of animals that harbor these viruses. So it just puts us on, on guard, I think, that this is a continuing danger. Talk a little bit more about Dr. Xi and how she has responded throughout this. Well, of course, she's in a very difficult um, uh, position. It's not very pleasant to think you have been responsible for the possible release of a pathogen that has killed so many mil- millions of people around the world. Doc- Dr. Xi is uh, simply denying that the virus came from her, her lab. I guess she, she doesn't have a lot of freedom in what she says. She has to go along with the uh, official Chinese verdict of what happened, and there is no you know, light between what she says and what the Chinese government says. She did respond recently to the, uh, the, the May 14 letter from the group of, uh, of leading scientists saying that lab leaks should be investigated. She did respond in an email to the MIT Technology Review um, saying that uh, it was sad to read this letter, that there was no way of finding evidence for something that didn't exist. It was quite unacceptable for people to want to look at her lab um, records. So it was, <clears throat> it was just a, a, a stonewall. If, in fact, this did not happen from the lab, if it happened naturally, what should we be concerned about then, given that there isn't the path that was normally taken by these things, as you talked about with SARS-1? Um, well, that's a very good point, and we should certainly keep our mind open to the possibility that it's natural emergence. That's still on the table. There's no direct evidence for lab escape. Um if it is natural emergence, it is kind of scary that it seems to have been, it would seem to have been more of a sort of once-off event rather than a sort of steady evolutionary progression as we've uh, seen for SARS-1. It must have been, you know, maybe um, just a sing. could it have been just a sort of single bat in- infecting a single person? I mean, evolution doesn't usually work that way. Evolution usually requires, you know, thousands or billions of attempts, almost all of which end in failure before you get a sort of successful mutation that allows a virus to expand its its host range. If COVID-19 came to us through a sort of single such mutation, it's sort of, it's going to be much harder to find how that happened and it's going to be almost impossible to prevent future occurrences. I was going to say, is it more frightening in a way if if it was a single mutation like that that happened in in a way that's different from from all other natural occurrences, should that scare us even more? Yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Because it shows, I mean, evolution is very chanced by uh, uh, trying something many times over until it gets something that works. Um, And if it can do something much more easily, if it can accomplish something like COVID-19 much more easily, then we're, we're walking on much thinner ice than we assumed. Finally, what would you like to see happen now to try and and make the determination, if it's even possible, as to whether this was natural emergence or something that escaped from the lab? Well, what I would like to see is is uh, a lot more pressure put on China to uh, open up its records and tell us uh, what it knows. I mean, up to now, the Chinese have had a completely free ride because all the mainstream media has uh, been behind the natural emergence theory. So no pressure on China to, to open up. Um, everyone was complacent about the manipulated WHO inquiry that, that, that parroted the Chinese uh, line, said lab escape was extremely unlikely. But the, the, the tide of public opinion has, has turned almost overnight so if we can get things like the intelligence uh, uh, report that uh, President Biden has commissioned, and probably more important, if we could get credible groups of scientists convened, I don't know, by the National Academy of Sciences or by the Royal Society in, in London, to look into this issue with an open mind and to arrive at the conclusion that, yes, on present evidence, lab escape seems more likely, all these kind of findings, I think, would build pressure on on China to open up its uh, the records of the Wuhan Institute and come clean. I mean, I'm not saying that's likely, but it seems to me possible and certainly worth trying. Why do you think public opinion has changed so quickly? Uh, it's very strange. I, I really have no explanation. I have no good explanation for it. My, my best guess is this. It's that the 
the WHO inquiry to Beijing, which was reported in February, uh, was not such a big propaganda uh, victory as the Chinese hope, hoped, because although the, the inquiry sort of trotted out its sort of scripted conclusion that lab escape was very unlikely, what was also very clear was that the Chinese had absolutely no evidence to offer the commission in favor of, la of natural emergence. So the world could see, well, this theory that we've been implicitly backing for more than a year, there's just no support for it, well after the, the, the due date when you would expect such support. I think that sort of opened people's mind to the possibility that maybe, maybe it was time to consider the alternative theory. So then in May, um, I don't know what effect my article in medium.com and the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists may have had. Um, it's had about 2 million page views so far. That may have sort of helped change the climate of opinion. And then, of course, I think more decisively, you had the the May 14 letter from the 18 scientists in Science magazine. So this was the first time that a, a sort of credible group of scientists had said we should take a serious look at lab escape. And suddenly the whole, the whole sort of world's media pivoted and said, yes, we should take a look at lab escape, something they had failed to do for a whole year. Now suddenly it seemed the right thing to do. Um, it's just very strange how the human mind works. That's not really a serious answer to your question, but I have the first but part I think of what it's I said. an accurate one nonetheless. <laughs> Nicholas Wade, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me on your show. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.